voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. He strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry of glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the Lord. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people.
rock and my redeemer read his treasure of my longing soul my god like you there is no other true delight is found in you alone your grace oh well too deep to fathom your love exceeds the heavens reach your truth i found a perfect church. We'd like to welcome you to the morning service of Berean Bible Church here on this Palm Sunday, a time in which we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is the King uh, of all kings. Uh, never forget that. I mean, we serve a risen Savior, you mean an arisen King, and we're here to bring you hope and encouragement this morning. And to start out uh, our service as we uh, look forward to the uh, Passion Week of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to read to you from the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, I think about those verses and how wonderful they are. To consider, I mean, the Lord Jesus, especially this week as, uh, you know, we move toward Good Friday and, uh, and Easter Sunday. And we think of what all was going through the Lord Jesus' perfect mind, you I mean, there that week. And as we continue to, uh, to, to think about that, we read these words that we're to fix our eyes on him. Uh, the, the author and, and the perfecter of our faith. It says, who for the joy set before him. In other words, how did he get through that, that difficult period, this difficult week coming up? He got through it. He says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, he looked past that. He looked to the joy of being resurrected and the, and the joy of being, you know, with the, with the Father, I mean, forever, to sit down after the work was finished. And having that fellowship with the Father again and, and, and uh, just allowing him to observe and see all of the, the things that uh, his work on the cross provided. The salvation of so many. Our salvation. 
He endured, you mean, the shame and the suffering because of the joy that was set before him. You know, we, we miss you folks. I mean, and I hope that you miss us as well. Uh, and there is just no substitute an online service can be for being together in the flesh. But I know this, that there will be a time of great joy and a great celebration when we move through this. And we have a chance to all be together, I mean, again, you I mean, here as a church family. And we, we look forward to that. And so, I mean, for that joy, that joyous day that's coming. I mean, we too, you mean, endure the difficult days, uh, I mean, in which we find ourselves. But remember, you mean, that there's always hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to uh, bring to you a couple of announcements right now uh, as uh, things are changing very rapidly around here as we adjust to the, uh, the new temporary normal uh, for a while. We do want to uh, remind you that following the service after a, a short break, uh, there will be our kids' service. There'll be some expanded songs with some motions, and uh, I understand that there'll be a couple special guests uh, that will be here, I mean, as well, including one Polly the Penguin. So kids, hopefully you're looking forward to that. I know that, uh, that I am. Uh, if, uh, if you are a senior, you mean this morning, and uh, you are uh, struggling uh, and uh, you're lonely or uh, even you're in need, uh, you know, a member of our, our congregation here, please remember that, uh, you know, you can call us. Uh, we have folks lined up to deliver groceries, to get medications, to bring you CDs of the service, uh, whatever you would need. If you just need to talk to somebody, you mean, hey, give us a call in the office. Uh, you mean, we'll reach out to you. Um, we want to minister to you in that way. Um, also, if you are struggling with work, you've lost your job or you're out of work, <clears throat> there are some folks that are contacting us with some possible oppor job opportunities. Uh, and we're kind of serving as a hub. If you do have a job opportunity that, uh, you know, we'd like someone just needs to do some work around your house or whatever it may be or in your yard, please give us a call. Uh, I mean, we can maybe help with uh, some of those things. Uh, just reach out to us. We know that as this drags on and, uh, you know, many are struggling with their employment, um, you know, we are definitely praying for all of you in that. Uh, also, we want to uh, just uh, give, a, give a praise to the Lord. I mean, our, uh, our giving uh, continues. Uh, and we do encourage everyone to continue to, uh, to give to the Lord's work as you can. Um, and uh, <clears throat> you can do that uh, online. Uh, you can also uh, mail in your envelope, you mean, to the, to the church, uh, and uh, you'll get your tax credit for that as well. Um, and we want to just offer praise to the Lord because last week's offering was over $16,000. And that's so we're rejoicing in that, uh, that folks are giving to the Lord's work. Uh, and uh, we thank you and ask you to continue that. Uh, also coming up uh, this week, we have some special services to let you know about. <clears throat> We have the Good Friday service, uh, which is going to be live streamed at 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, and it's going to be a roundtable discussion amongst the pastors. And uh, we're, we have some uh, pre-made up questions that we're going to be uh, uh, dealing with. And also we encourage you that if you have questions on the passion story, I mean the Good Friday events or anything, you know, concerning the cross work of the Lord Jesus, and you uh, always had a question about something, send those in to us, email us this week, I mean, and uh, we're going to leave a time at the end where we'll answer some of those questions. And also on the live stream, you'll be able to type in into the chat some of your questions and we'll pull some of those off. We'll save some time at the end of that, again, 7 p.m. On, on Good Friday. Uh, Pastor Nick is going to be doing a sunrise service live from Pottstown uh, at, I believe, 7, uh, 7 uh, a.m. Is that correct, Nick? 7 a.m. Uh, and uh, so please turn in, tune in for that as well. It will be live streamed. And then our normal, good, uh, normal Easter Sunday uh, service at 1030 will be live streamed here as well. Uh, also, just uh, throughout the week, uh, a couple things. Youth group uh, will be live streaming on Tuesday as well, 7 p.m. Uh, contact the church office or Caleb directly. Uh, he's using Zoom as the platform for that. Uh, and uh, he will get you the password to get your uh, teenagers in there. Uh, also, a uh, men's group is uh, doing some things online as well at 7 p.m. on Tuesday evenings. You can contact the church office uh, or Earl Lynch, uh, you know, for uh, how to get connected with that. And uh, the ladies' Bible studies are also continuing. Uh, I mean, and um, they're going online as well on Tuesdays, uh, you know, one in the morning at 1030 and another at 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, you can uh, 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 call the church office for the information about how to get connected uh, with that also. Uh, and, I mean, then if you are uh, just joining us or watching us and you're not part of the Brian family, we've been, uh, uh, you know, giving a lot of salvation messages and you're not sure about your relationship with God or how you can know him personally, um, we, uh, we would, you know, just ask you to reach out to us, I mean, and give us a call. And our church information is, uh, you know, your contact us on our website. The information is on the screen for you. Uh, and um, one last thing that uh, I'm also going to be doing a uh, three- to four-part series uh, on the book of Habakkuk and how it relates to our time. It's shocking, really, how relevant uh, these uh, books written thousands of years ago are, and I'll be posting them up uh, probably on our YouTube channel or our Facebook channel as well, so you can uh, take part in those and enjoy those uh, this week. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, with that, we're going to turn it over to Pastor Caleb for the Scripture reading and prayer. Amen. 
Good morning. Our scripture reading is found in the book of Luke this morning. And we'll be reading verses 28 through 44. It says this, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead of those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Uh, At this time, I want to turn your uh, attention to our missions and focus, uh, and I want to give you just a a few moments uh, to pray uh, for those missionaries, and then I will lead you in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, do just thank you for being a great God, uh, a sovereign God, a God who sits on his throne. Uh, Lord, and we understand that the, even in the, the current times that we live and uh, looking around, we, we see panic and chaos and fear. But Lord, uh, again, you, we recognize that you are in total control, that, that none of this has taken you by surprise. Lord, that uh, you knew of this long ago. Lord, you know the outcome. Lord, you know how long this will last. And Lord, we just trust in you. We trust that, uh, Lord, even in this, even uh, in the midst of this virus, that you are uh, bringing about your plans. Lord, that you are working this all together uh, for our good and for your purposes. And Lord, we uh, pray for those this morning uh, who, who are sick. Uh, Lord, who are struggling financially, physically. Emotionally, mentally, Lord, we, we uh, ask that you would draw near to those uh, who are brokenhearted, to those who are downcast, that you would show yourself in a mighty way, bring them peace and comfort. Lord, we uh, do thank you uh, that even though we're unable to meet together uh, physically, we do thank you for the technology to, to at least live stream and, and uh, Lord, bring forth your word in that way. Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, as Pastor Jace brings a message today, that you would speak through him in, in a powerful way. Lord, that he would speak the truth uh, boldly. Lord, that uh, people would uh, be listening. Uh, Lord, that hearts would be opened and, and softened to your word. Lord, that you would teach and correct. Lord, and challenge each one of us as we hear your word this morning. Lord, I thank you for those that are here this morning. I thank you for our worship team as they lead us in, in, in praise. Lord, that uh, even in difficult times, Lord, you are worthy of praise. It's not just the good times, but even in the bad. Lord, we praise you for you are good, for you are holy, and you are worthy. Lord, thank you again for our time this morning. Pray that you would be honored and glorified and lifted up. And we pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. As we've already been stated this morning, is, is Palm Sunday. Now, it seems a little weird 
not having Palm Sunday uh, with, with all of you. But I'm sure you can still celebrate it at home. So we're going to be singing together. All glory, Lord, and honor. So I need, guys, I, need to, I need you guys to sing out loud even on your couches, okay? So sing with us as we sing. All glory, Lord, and honor. Thinking about uh, receiving Christ as he walks into Jerusalem. Think about all the, the fanfare and the joy they had in, in uh, accepting him then. Now, a lot different than the following week. But at least for now, think about the joy of receiving your king. Edit that part out. <laughs> All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children they sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comes. The King and Blessed One The company of angels Are praising Thee on high And mortal men and all things Create and make reply The people of the Hebrews With songs and prayer and anthems before thee we present to thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise to thee now exalted our melody we raise thou didst accept their praises accept prayers we bring who in all good delight is thou good and gracious King well every uh, first of the month we start to learn a new song together and this isn't any different and uh, this was a highly requested song probably got more requests for this one than I've ever gotten for a song before, and it's easy to see why. It's a beautiful song. Uh, Christ is our hope in life and death, and it's something we all need to remember uh, at this time in history, and that's what it is. This is, a, uh, this is something that my kids will be reading about in their history books, but uh, Christ is our hope through all of it. So um, this is actually going to be something we've never done before called Song of the Months plural, in that uh, you guys will be hearing it on your computer or your device all throughout this month, but we're going to sing it together next month as well, because I need, I need to hear our voices singing hallelujah together. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong, who holds our days within his hand, what comes apart from his command, and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life. Truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good. God is. 
is good, where is his grace and goodness known in our great Redeemer's blood? the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, I hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the great what will we say? Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy. When Christ is ours forevermore Oh, sing hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, sing hallelujah Now and ever we confess Christ our hope and life and death Thank you for giving us hope in life and death, the hope that was found in your son. May we continue to cling to the truths of your scriptures during these hard times. Remember that you give us a future and a hope with you for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, beloved of the Lord. It's very difficult, especially during the what's referred to in the church calendar as a holy week to uh, uh, be so separated uh, from one another. Uh, certainly all that we can do here electronically does not make up for uh, being together uh, and fellowshipping together during these uh, precious times, uh, especially over the holidays. I do want to thank Adam and Sarah Nante uh, because I guess you call them the producers of all this. Without them, uh, we would really be at a loss uh, but we uh, so much uh, praise and, and thank uh, the Lord for the opportunity that we have and uh, for those who have been praying for us, uh, those who are ministering uh, to us this morning uh, right here from Berean Bible Church. So uh, we want to uh, uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, we uh, trust that uh, uh, you will be blessed by our study uh, in the Word of God uh, this morning. Uh, now, as we were saying when uh, we started out in all this, we had just started a study in the book of Luke and we're at the birth narrative. Pastor Jeff was dealing with some of that last week. But of course, with the Easter holidays now, we're going to be uh, jumping ahead a bit uh, for a few weeks uh, and uh, then we'll come back uh, to our uh, studies, our expositional work in the book of Luke, back to chapter 2. But actually, where we come to this morning, I want to back up into where Pastor Jeff was a little bit last week because the book ends uh, very nicely uh, with our passage of Scripture this morning. Because if you remember, back in Luke chapter uh, 2, uh, that when we uh, finished up there uh, toward uh, the end of uh, verses 14 and things, but in verse uh, 11, I want to pick up there, the angels were announcing the birth of Christ. 
And it says, for unto you, <coughs> the angels announced to the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace amongst them with whom he is well pleased. So we start with that praise. There was angelic praise, a celebration of the birth of Christ, the bringer of peace, the one who can bring peace to earth through a right relationship with God. And so they were praising because a Savior was born. I think Pastor Jeff referred to that last week. He said that Jesus was much more than a teacher or a philosopher or even a religious leader. He was the Savior of all of mankind. He is the Savior of all of mankind. And now we come to Jesus about 33 years later, and they're having a celebration of his entrance into Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19, which Caleb read for you. The celebration of his Messiahship. And by the way, this is the only time in the ministry of Jesus where he allowed a public demonstration on his behalf. And you might ask, why? Why did he allow that? Well, to because he was going to be fulfilling the prophecy, uh, presenting himself as Israel's king. Here in, in what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we have Jesus offered to the nation of Israel as their king. I've never really cared for that idea of this being the triumphal entry because there's so much heartache. There's nothing sadder to me than uh, the, 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 uh, what we call the triumphal entry because of the shallowness of it. And I've entitled this message, You Can't Fool Jesus, because even though there's this celebration that does take place, it's very short-lived. And it's very shallow. Jesus present, is presented as the king of Israel. We have that prophesied. He's fulfilling the prophecy uh, of the book of Zechariah, chapter 9 and verse 9. I'm going to try to turn to these passages and read them for you this morning. There is a lot of scripture, but I want to get it out to you. In Zechariah 9, there was a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Now we would say that's a very humble thing. And it is a humble thing that Christ came on the foal of a donkey. On a donkey that had never been ridden, that had never been trained. But it submitted itself to the Savior. But that was traditional in Israel that a king would come when he was presented on a donkey in humility as one who would rule and reign in humility before God. And so Jesus is presented here in this, uh, uh, on this Palm Sunday as Israel's king. And so he's fulfilling prophecy. And he's forcing, actually, he is forcing the religious leaders who are opposed to him to act. See, originally, you know, the, the, the religious leaders in this Holy Week, they're going to have to arrest Jesus, but that wasn't their original intent. It's not what they wanted to do. Yes, they hated Jesus. Yes, they wanted him arrested. But now is not the time. During the Passover feast, Jerusalem is swelled. They don't want to cause any problems there in Jerusalem. They didn't want to have problems with the Romans. Uh, they didn't want the, a riot amongst the people because Jesus has reached the height of his popularity. But now's the time to act. In Matthew, actually it tells us in Matthew chapter uh, 26, and I, and I want to uh, turn there for you and, and read it uh, to you. Uh, Matthew 26, uh, verses uh, 3 to 5. You know, they, there was a plot to kill Jesus. They had had this leading up, but now they have to suspend it for a time. It says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. But they came to the conclusion, it says in verse 5, not during the feast, not during the feast of the Passover. When Jesus is entering on Palm Sunday, it is for the Passover feast that will take place at the end of the week. They said, we can't do this 
during the Passover feast, lest there be an uproar and a riot amongst the people. They have sought to uh, destroy Jesus for quite some time, and they haven't been able to. Why? Because it wasn't yet the time. Jesus' time had not come. If you turn to, and there's many passages uh, throughout Scripture, I'll just give you a couple. Uh, in the book of John, uh, in the book of John, chapter, uh, well, let's start with John chapter 1. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, see, Jesus came knowing that he was going to go to the cross. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, we have Jesus presented publicly there to John the, the Baptist. And John seeing him, the next day when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came with the express purpose of taking away the sins of the world, the sins of all of mankind, the sins of Israel, and the sins of the Gentile world as well. It's been extended unto us. But when he came... Of course, Israel rejected him. They're going to formally reject him here on this Palm Sunday and the week that leads up to his crucifixion. But throughout his ministry, the religious leaders of the day, who were the great enemies of Christ, stood against him. In chapter 7, verse, let's uh, go down to verse 30. Chapter 7 and verse 30, it says, So, these religious leaders were seeking to arrest him, to arrest Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You flip over to chapter 8 and uh, verse 20. And there again it says, In these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. He had been there earlier in the temple. But no one arrested him because of his teaching that they were opposed to, because his hour, <clears throat> excuse me, had not yet come. There were times they took this to stone him, and he passed in their midst. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. But now as we enter the beginning of this Holy Week, his hour has come. His hour has approached. In John chapter 13, Verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In John 17, 1, he has his high priestly prayer for all believers, for all those who were his disciples and truly had their faith and trust in him, and all of us. He prays for us there. All that who would come after him, who would follow him, who would believe and receive Christ as a Savior. He has what's called his high priestly prayer there for every believer. And it starts out, that prayer starts out, that Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. What? The hour for his arrest. The hour for him to go to the cross. The hour for him to pay for our sins, to become indeed the Savior of the world. And so here we see this starting to come into play. And it begins with this entry into Jerusalem. And there's a theme, there's a celebration. Who doesn't like a celebration? You wish you could be here celebrating with us. Who doesn't like a parade? And that's basically what takes place. And if we turn now back to uh, Luke chapter 19... And Caleb read for us how they were throwing their garments in the way and they were rejoicing over Jesus. And I want to pick up here in uh, verse 37 of Luke chapter 19 and uh, verse 37. And he was drawing nigh, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So the crowds are enthusiastic. Why? For all the miracles that he had done. 
for all the things that they had seen. And they begin to quote from the psalm, from Psalm 118. This is a quote from Psalm 118. And it's, it's a psalm of royal entry. It's a psalm that was written to the king, to the Messiah. It's a messianic psalm. One that would be proclaimed when the time came to the Messiah. These people are seeing him as their Messiah, or the crowds were at least. But what did they understand? It's hard to tell exactly what they understood when they were doing this. As a matter of fact, take note, it doesn't say they were praising him because their Savior had come. They were praising him for the mighty miracles. They were looking for a deliverer. We don't know exactly what they understood about that, but we know uh, that there was a lot of praise here without true uh, comprehension of exactly what was taking place. See, that's what happens with a crowd. That's what happens with a mob. That's what happens when everybody runs in one direction. You know, you can get swept up in the moment and not really know why you're doing the things that you're doing. It's, it's like the toilet paper shortage, right? Everybody decided when the virus broke that you needed to have toilet paper. Now, I was able to read some articles and find out, you know where the shortage began? In Australia, of all places. That somehow in Australia, people started to make a run on the grocery stores and on all stores to buy up all the toilet paper that they could. And that thing went around the world. And people don't even know why they have two years worth of toilet paper in their house. Why? Because everybody was buying it, so they bought it. That says something about mankind, doesn't it? And the way that we're driven, and the way that we think, and the way that we move. And so these people entered, and people began to praise the Lord Jesus. They had great reason to do it. He had done miraculous things. And he had taught things that, that they had never heard before. And he had raised the dead. He's right off of, uh, of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And so it was natural to think, this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. But the euphoria of that moment is going to be very short-lived. It's going to be very brief. Why? Because they weren't praising him exactly for the right reason. They weren't praising him with full comprehension. Yes, his mighty works, but not as the Savior. Remember, in Luke chapter 2, it says the angels were praising because a Savior has been born. A Savior's come into the world, to all people. And he says, peace. The angel said, peace on earth. But notice what the people say here, prophetically, not even knowing. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. Not knowing, it said, there's no peace in the earth because Christ has come because most have rejected him. We can have peace in heaven if we know him as our personal savior. Because the king was rejected on earth, there's no peace. But there's constant conflict in the world between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil. There's no peace in this world yet. But thanks be to God, because of Christ's finished work on the cross, there's peace with God available to each one of us in heaven. By receiving Christ as our Savior. By accepting what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Here they're proclaiming a king. The people are, the leaders are opposed to it, the crowd is supportive of him at this moment, and actually people, I, I've run into people say, Jesus never claimed to be the savior, Jesus never claimed to be a king. Listen, in verse 40 there it says, and they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why? What they're saying isn't true. But what does Jesus say? He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. He's confirming that what they said is true. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one of God. And he said, if these people don't say it, even the very rocks would cry and verify the claims that these people 
are making. You know, it's a funny thing about crowds. They're fickle and frivolous. They're here today and gone tomorrow. Jesus would find that out. He knew it all along. It would play out as such. Crowds can one day be praising you and quickly abandon you and turn ugly and riotous. And so while the people were rejoicing, Jesus was weeping. Because look at verse 41. It says, and when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. The people had a celebration, but Jesus has a lamentation saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your armies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Listen, crowds can fool us. The philosophies of the day, the thoughts of the day, the instructions of the day, and they change for us right now, don't they? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. The one thing that's consistent is keep you washing your hands. Do that. But listen, Jesus wasn't fooled. You cannot fool Jesus. He knows the intent, the thought, the direction of every single heart. Jesus wasn't fooled because they were looking for the wrong Jesus. They had been promised a Messiah and a king, but instead of looking for one who would save them from their sins first and primarily, they were looking for a warrior. They were looking for a national deliverer. They were looking for a miracle worker. They wanted someone to come and break off the yoke of the Romans from them and set up a kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Now, Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, not in that first visit where he provided for the salvation of each and every person individually. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem when he returns the second time. But this first time he came to deliver them from their sins. See, they wanted a Jesus that, that would just do things for them nationally and as the nation of Israel. They, they wanted all these things from Jesus without seeing their need from salvation, from, from being saved from their sin. They didn't want to be judged. They didn't want to repent and change and live differently and believe differently. And like Israel, many of us want a Jesus who doesn't judge us. Who doesn't say that we're sinners who are in need of deliverance. They want a Jesus without repentance. They want a Jesus who comes and does miracles for them and takes away diseases and things. But we're not going to change the way that we live. We're not going to change the way that we believe. See, repentance means to change the way you look at things, to change what you believe, and to go in a different direction. And if you really believe, then you'll live differently. They wanted Jesus where they didn't have to change their beliefs. They didn't have to change their attitudes. They didn't have to change their actions. And I'm afraid that that's what the world wants today. We're in a difficult time. We're in a trial and people are talking about Jesus. But are they talking about their sin? Are they talking about their need for salvation? Are they talking about our need to live and act differently than we've been acting? And because of this, it says Jesus wept. This is the second time in scripture where it's recorded that Jesus wept openly. He wept when he went to the grave of Lazarus. And there in the Greek, it says that he wept and sobbed quietly. And people will say, why, why was he crying? Why was he crying about that? You know, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He was crying because of what death and, and disease and things do to, to the human race. That death is not a natural thing. That it came upon the world because of sinfulness. It wasn't part of his original creation. That because of our sin, all of creation is groaning and, and, and it's under, it's, it's, it's fallen. And Jesus came into this falling world to deliver us from the power of sin. And eventually he's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin. 
But he's crying now. Not silently. This, this, the word he uses here that he wept, it was a loud lamentation as one who mourns for the dead. Why was he weeping? Because the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, were destroying themselves. Everywhere he looked, while they celebrated, he had a reason to weep. If he looked backwards, he saw the wasted opportunities. He saw the wasted opportunities of all the things that he had cried out to his people and they had rejected him. They had turned away from him. In Matthew chapter 23, this is a, this is a passage as a, as a country boy that's always been very uh, near to my heart. A picture that's painted for us in Matthew 23 verses 37 and 38. A little later in the week, Jesus would say this about Jerusalem. Here he cries over it. A little later he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not this time, the next time. You won't see me again until I come the second time. This time I come and I look backward and he wept because of wasted opportunities. I have sent the prophets to you. I have sent my word to you. And I've called to you. But you refused to repent. You refused to turn. You refused to put your faith and trust in me. And so he wept as he looked backward. He wept as he looked within at the spiritual ignorance and blindness. Why in verse 44 he says, because you do not know the time of your visitation. When was the time of their visitation? Right then. That was the peak of it. Here I am presenting myself as your king and as your Lord and as your Savior and you will not have me. And he presents himself to us daily. We have the, the gospels. We have this completed story. And there's so much spiritual ignorance and blindness. So when he looked backward and when he looked within, he saw and wept. And when he looked around, he saw this religious activity. But there was no real reality to it. Would they really turn to him? Would they really humble themselves? And he wept when he looked ahead. We see him there giving a prophecy concerning the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you. He's prophesying of something that's going to happen in about 40 years. What? The destruction of Jerusalem under the, the Roman general Titus who is going to come to crush a Jewish rebellion in 70 AD. This is historical. He will lay siege to the city of Jerusalem for 143 days. And then the city will fall. And 600,000 Jews died in the fall of Jerusalem. Thousands more were taken captive. They destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And the city itself is completely destroyed. You talk about a pandemic. That's a pandemic of violence. And Jesus weeps for them. He laments because they didn't recognize the real Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 11, it says that Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. He tells a parable in Luke chapter 19 right before he enters into the city of, of, a, uh, of a man who went and came to claim his, king, his kingdom, a son. And he's referring to himself there in Luke chapter 19 verse 14. It says, but his citizens hated him when he came. When the king came and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. We will not have this one to reign over us. And what they were really rejecting, they didn't reject his miracles. 
They wouldn't have rejected him if he could have come and raised an army and beaten off the Romans. They rejected that part of needing a savior, of one who would die on the cross to pay for their sins. In just a few short days, the same crowd that was praising him will turn against him. In Luke chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, it says this, And Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people and after ex examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. When they do arrest him and they send him to the Roman authorities, Pilate says, not guilty. I can't find anything in the charges against him. And look how the people react. But they all cried, verse 18 it says, but they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. Verse 21. Because Pilate didn't want to do that. He said, what about Jesus? Why would you want this criminal Barabbas released to you? Let me uh, release Jesus to you. But they kept, it says, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found no guilt deserving of death. Hey, I'll just punish him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. That's the tyranny of the crowd, isn't it? That's the tyranny of the mob. They rejected him as the one who was to be their savior. You see, Jesus came to bring either salvation or judgment to the nation of Israel. And it's the same for each and every one of us. Jesus cried because he said, they don't know the things that make for peace. The thing that makes for peace within our hearts and within our lives is the, is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that's what the, you know, we, we've looked at this celebration and a lamentation. Now you have to make the determination. Which side are you here? Are you going to be part of this crowd that makes some noises for Jesus but really doesn't care, really doesn't know the time of your visitation and exactly who Jesus was and is? People are crying out today in our society for deliverance. Especially in light of the, of the, Coronavirus. And it is life-altering, life-changing. Some have died. Some of your lives have been forever altered. And at the very least, we've all have been inconvenienced. But where are we looking for our salvation, ultimately? God has allowed this virus to come at the very least. And he can take it away overnight if he so desired. But most of you are saying, listen, we need to look to the scientists. As a matter of fact, there was a person in the New York Times, a woman who wrote the article, laying the blame for the coronavirus at the feet of Christians because we're anti-scientists. We're, we're against science, they say. Are you kidding me? True biblical Christians are never against science because God is the greatest scientist there ever was and ever will be. And every scientist labors under the one who created all things. They all study under the greatest scientist ever. We're not anti-science. I'm anti-junk science. I'm anti the science that goes against the word of God, of the ultimate scientist who wrote to us and told us our needs and told us these things. Some cry for deliverance are looking for us to unite as, as people. And, and I've been impressed with the way most people have been uniting during this time. They have inconvenienced themselves. And some are reaching out and some are st and they're staying home and, they're, and you're washing your hands and, and you're not supposed to touch your face. And they're making masks for people and, and for, the, for the workers on the front lines, the nurses and doctors. 
And all of that is great. All of those are wonderful things, but they're not nearly enough. They're not nearly enough for what's ultimately wrong with mankind, what's ultimately wrong with our nation and the world. I have seen more enthusiasm for, for Jesus. And I see him reaching out and saying, we need to look to the teeth of Jesus. We need for him to help us. But most of that many times is limited to memes and uh, without any true repentance. There's some enthusiasm for Jesus, but enthusiasm for Jesus doesn't cut it. There was enthusiasm for Jesus in our story this morning and throughout this last week. Let me share some things. It says, throughout the last week, the gospel writers record again and again the crowd's enthusiasm for Jesus. The crowds answered this. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee, Ma Matthew 21, 11. It says the whole crowd was amazed at his teachings, Mark 11, 18. All the people hung on his words, Luke 19, 48. All the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple, Luke 21, 38. The people held that he was a prophet. Matthew 21, 46. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teachings. Matthew 22, 33. And the large crowd listened to him with delight. Mark 12, 37. That's quite a write-up. That's quite an endorsement of Jesus. Yet that enthusiasm wasn't enough. Because even after all of that, we see that a little later in the week, they'll cry out, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. We won't have this man. Why? Because all they had done and all they taught at the end of the day, they did not recognize him as their savior. And enthusiasm for Jesus alone is not going to cut it, folks. And I hear people now saying there's a great theme with this. We're all in this together. And that's true. We're all in this together against coronavirus, but even above and beyond this, all the world is united in its need for Jesus as their Savior, as the one who came and gave himself for him. Because I'm going to tell you, they're going to get a, 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 a pill, they're going to get a shot that does away with this coronavirus or that inoculates us against this eventually. That's, that's coming, I'm pretty certain. But doctors don't have a pill or a shot for man's greatest disease. Nor can they ever have it. For the disease of sin. For that which separates us from God for all of eternity. If we leave this realm of time without him. Listen, if you're tuned in to us and you've never received Christ as your personal savior. See, you can be enthusiastic for Jesus. You can have gone to church all of your life. You can say, I'm a big fan of Jesus. But do you know him as your Savior? That's what's really important. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Because the scriptures are clear again and again and again that we are in need of a Savior. We're in need of something that only Jesus can give us. In the book of Romans... Chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, and I want to begin with verse 23. In Romans 3, 23, it says, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has the disease of sin. Back up in that same chapter, Romans 3, verse 10, it says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. Of our own accord, of our, left to our own devices, none of us is righteous. None of us is worthy of heaven. None of us understands. None of us seeks after God. Verse 12 says, we have all turned aside. Together we have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. What's that tell us? We're all sin sick. We all are filled with a disease that only Jesus can deal with. Only the visitation of Jesus offers peace. That wonderful theme of all scripture, John 3, 16, says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came to provide life. That was prophesied back in Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Hundreds of years before he went to the cross, it says this, Surely, Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we, estreamed, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. For all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The people in the crowd rejected him. I rejected him. You rejected him. When Christ went to the cross of Calvary long before I was born, he bore my iniquity. He bore my sin on the cross of Calvary. And he made it available. And how do you receive it? In faith. By putting your faith and trust in him alone. Not in the scientist, not in the doctor, not in your good works, not in church attendance, not in baptism, but in the precious blood of Christ who gave himself for us. I'm coming to the end here, but I want you to see this. This is the most important part. This is the highlight of the whole message in Acts chapter 3. Verse 19, when Peter was preaching, he said this, 319. Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. See, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we become washed in the blood of Christ who made atonement for us, who was our substitute on the cross of Calvary. There in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name than the name of Jesus, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We're all going to answer to the Lord Jesus. We're all accountable to him. Either you're going to see him as your savior or your judge. Remember in Zechariah 9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey and a colt on the foal of a donkey? He's coming to you. He's righteous. He gives you his righteousness. He gives you his salvation provided on the cross. The innocent died in the place of the guilty. He died in our place on the cross of Calvary. Three days later, he rose again to show that he had conquered death. And it says, because he has risen, we shall raise also all who put their faith and trust in him. He came to us providing salvation. He's coming again. To rule and to reign. He's coming in righteousness. He is coming in judgment. As a terrible judge. It's recorded for us. In Revelation chapter 19. An awesome passage. And it's wonderful. You know Christ is your savior. But it's terrible if you do not. For it says when he comes back in the second time. And he comes as a judge. It says then I saw heaven and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. The one sitting on it is Christ who is called faithful and true. A white horse. A war horse. The one who is sitting on it is faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. And his eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. The living word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, linen white and pure, were following him on white horses. Listen, if you know him as your savior today, you're going to be on one of those white horses following him. What a wonderful and glorious time. 
but without him you face him as his judge. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How do you see Jesus this morning? The choice is yours. Are you going with the crowd or are you going with crowd, with, <laughs> with Christ? Excuse me. There's only one way to have peace with God, and that's through the cross of Jesus Christ. The crowd wound up rejecting him. Even though they made some wonderful noises at a certain time, they rejected him. And I've got to believe, do you think that the Lord Jesus is in heaven even now, weeping over our nation, weeping over our world? Yes, it's a terrible thing that people are dying. As I looked this morning, the number of confirmed cases in the United States of America, 311,000 confirmed cases, 8,500 dead. But then I looked at how many abortions there were in this country. The closest figures I would come were 2018. 876,000 babies were aborted in the United States of America that year. That's 73,000 deaths a month. We've had 8,000 in about a month, and that's, that's a terrible figure. But month in and month out, if we are, if we are averaging 70,000 deaths of unborn babies and have no repentance for that, no repentance for lifestyles that completely ignore the word of God, we're a nation in need of repentance and we're individuals in need of repentance. Individually today, you're, you're given that choice to choose. Which way are you going to go? The way of the crowd who just wants a Jesus who's going to do miracles for them and provide things for them and give them cars and boats and, and, and healings, but no change in our attitude, no embracing the word of God, no turning away from our sin as a nation as, and as individuals. I finish with Matthew chapter 7. And look, be good Bereans. Go over this. Check everything that I've said and see if it's not true. Search the scriptures daily. Because Jesus is the living word of God. Everything that he says in us here has been inspired by the word of God and is for our instruction and our teaching and raising up in righteousness. Yeah, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus laid out this choice for us. He says, enter by the narrow gate for, the gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. There's two roads, there's two gates. There's a wide gate and an easy gate that leads to destruction. And those who enter in by it are many. But the gate unto a life, unto eternal life, is narrow. And the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. It was a hard slog for Jesus. He had to go to the cross of Calvary on our behalf. And all we have to do is receive him. But to those who received him, he says, the nation rejected him as whole, but those who received, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. Are you a child of God? Are you a child of God this morning? All you have to do is admit and acknowledge that you're a sinner. And then receive the one who gave himself in your place. He died for you and he loves you. And he weeps and laments if you do not come. But he is a righteous God. The choice will be yours. If you do not follow him and allow him to become the king and the Lord of your life, the savior of your life, then you will face him as your judge. And that judgment lasts for all eternity. Make that decision. If you have questions about it, call us at the church. Visit our website. Seek out the truth because it's far, far, far more important than anything else you'll ever do in life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, oh, how we thank you that we have one who came to be our Savior. 
God who loved us so much that he took on flesh and came and gave himself on our behalf. And I pray, Father, that every person listening, all of us would know the time of our visitation. That, Father, even now, some have maybe never heard that Jesus came to die for their sins. This is their time of visitation. Help them to know the ways of peace, the ways of peace with God. When we have peace with God, then we have peace with people around about us, and we have peace with the world, and we have peace with the trying times in which we live. For, Father, we know, even as the word says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, that we have life and have it everlastingly through Christ. And, Father, we have abundant life, glorious life, precious life. We pray, Father, that all those around about us might know it. Take, Father, these scourges from our land. Heal it, Father. We pray that people would repent and turn and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and make him the Lord of their life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing Now time for our communion service so if you'd uh, like to join us with that uh, we would invite you at this time to uh, take out your elements uh, go grab those the juice and the bread uh, and if you are uh, joining with us at home we want to uh, remind you that uh, you know this is not the way that we normally do our communion service obviously it's not what we had wanted uh, normally we realize that this time is, uh, I mean, this special time for the Church of Jesus Christ to be together, uh, celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper together in person. But obviously extraordinary circumstances uh, have come upon us. Uh, and so we felt it uh, best here at the church that uh, we could do this, uh, you mean, at home, you mean, together, even though we're apart. Uh, and uh, so if you want to get those elements out at this time, we're going to proceed with our communion service. Uh, we would like to uh, remind all of you as well. Uh, that this time, uh, as we uh, come before the Lord's table, is only for those who, as Pastor Jace uh, just presented to us, uh, know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. You, know, you cannot remember, I mean, the death of a Savior that you do not know. Uh, and so we do invite those who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ, who have uh, uh, received him personally as Savior, uh, to join uh, with us. I mean, at this time, before the Lord's table. It is not the table of Brian Bible Church, it's the Lord's table, and so all who know him, I mean, are invited uh, to come. 
Uh, but uh, you do need to know, you mean him, you mean as your personal Savior in order to celebrate this uh, service with us. Uh, and so with that, I mean, uh, the Lord tells us that uh, when we come before his table, we're to do so in a worthy manner, and that's to believers. Uh, that uh, we should take a time to examine our hearts before we celebrate the Lord's table. Uh, to uh, get rid of all sin uh, that may be uh, lurking in our lives. Confess that to the Lord. He's faithful and just to forgive us of, uh, of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we might come before his table uh, you mean in a matter that might please him, you mean in a matter that would be clean before him. And so as we begin this service, we're just going to give a quiet moment for you folks at home uh, to bow your heads and your hearts uh, and to uh, talk to God and to pray, you know, whatever prayer be appropriate in your own heart. Let's just take a minute and pause. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would like to take you back to that final week of Christ's crowning sacrifice. Thousands of people were crowded in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And about uh, you know, thousands of years ago now, on this very day, the Lord Jesus comes riding into the city on that donkey's foal. And as he crests over the Mount of Olives, as Pastor uh, talked to us about, he sees the city. Uh, and he begins to weep over it because he knows, being the infinite God, what is about to take place. That many would be rejoicing and shouting Hosanna, but really in their hearts, they were going to reject him. That as he had come unto his own, that his own would not be receiving him, that many would turn their hearts from him, and just one week later, would be, crowd, would be shouting out for his blood. And so Jesus, uh, I mean, sometime during that week, sends out I mean, his disciples uh, later on to be able to prepare and make reservations for the upper room so that he might celebrate the Passover feast, uh, his last Passover feast, with those I mean, that he came to love so much in this world. And the scripture tells us, I mean, about this Passover meal just before his suffering. The scripture says that the Lord Jesus eagerly desired to be able to celebrate this with these loved ones, the twelve. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine all that was in the mind of the Lord Jesus, understanding every single thing that he would go through, and yet just before, a few hours before he's taken in the garden, he desires to have this one last moment with these sinful folks. And so they enter into the other, other upper room, and, and uh, even, even then, things begin to go wrong. Rather than enjoying this time with their Savior, they begin bickering and arguing about who's the greatest, and, and none of them is willing to serve, none of them is willing to take up the towel and do the simple chore of washing one another's feet in their pride and arrogance. And so the Lord humbles himself, being the Son of God, being about to die for their sins. He humbles himself and he takes up that cloth and he goes around and he washes their feet and turns that into a teachable moment. And of course, there in the, in the quietness of that room, hell's plans are, are fully put into motion. Scripture tells us that the devil puts it on the heart of Judas Iscariot to go and, and to betray Jesus. And so he leaves the room. The chief priests are already plotting how they're going to take him. The guards are already gearing up to go and arrest him in just a short while. And into the chaos of all of this, in that last meal as the men sat around that table and looked to their Lord, he takes the unleavened bread, quiets these folks down, and he makes an amazing statement. He says... This bread is the symbol of my body, 
which is for you. And the idea there in the text is, which is given for you. I wonder how much the disciples understood. Oh, Jesus had told them about his death. He had predicted what would happen, but I, I think it would be very hard for these men to get their minds around all of that and what was about to transpire in just a few hours. This bread is given for you. And we know that that bread represented his body, which he would allow to be broken, which he would allow to be, be torn asunder, his flesh, for the sins of of the whole world. Not only the sins of the folks there around that table, but ours as well, thousands of years later. Oh, what love. Oh, what mercy. Oh, what forgiveness exists in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. That on that night, he would give us these symbols to remember thousands of years later what he did for us. And so with that, would you please at home take the bread Remember again, this bread is the emblem, the symbol, a representation of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given up for us and for our sacrifice. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how Would you uh, take up the bread? We want to just take a time to give thanks to the Lord Jesus with a simple prayer, something simple like this. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body, which was given for me. And as you pray that prayer, would you take and eat? And as you do, would you remember the Savior? Now, after the Lord Jesus passed out that bread and the disciples ate, he also took up the cup. And again, he makes another astounding statement. That this cup, that that wine and those glasses was the new covenant in his blood. And he gave to us a second symbol to remind us of what he was about to do. And that was the shedding of his precious blood for our sins. It was his sacrifice on the cross that cleanses all of our soul's diseases. If you're at home and you're joining us for this communion service, and as you look at that cup and you look at that liquid, you're reminded of the blood of Christ, which is the only antidote to that poison of our soul. 
It's the only thing that cleanses. It's the only thing in the universe that has the power to remove sin. See, that's why Jesus came. That's what he was about to do in that upper room. And that's why he gave us this service. And we could look back thousands of years after this historical event and know what he did. He gave up his body and he shed his blood for our sin. We didn't deserve it. We could never earn it. But he gave us this precious gift. The gift of salvation through his death and the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of life to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful in my soul shall it As we come to that time in our service when we remember the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ again, we come to thank him with just a simple prayer. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. And after praying that prayer, would you drink? And as you do, remember him who paid the price for all our sins. And Lord Jesus, as we conclude our communion service this morning, we say with the songwriter, Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is our Savior's love for us. That he would find a way to bring us back to him again by the shedding of his precious blood on the cross. To save us from the worst enemy possible. Sin and death and hell. And Lord, we can have confidence that when we take our last breath here in this realm of time, Lord, we have the opportunity to again be with you in heaven for all eternity, our creator and our savior, because we are rightly related to him through the blood of his son. Lord, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for your cur curing our sin's disease. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. When with the ransomed in glory, his grace I last shall see. It will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love. Last time, sing it loud.
God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. But remember that we uh, do have our kids' service starting in just a couple minutes with some special guests, so please don't miss that. By the way, you don't have to be a kid to stick around. I saw you signing on last week, Mario Bortz, so uh, let's see some more of that. All right. See you later.